Hi, this is Steve Abaddon of phage.org, phage-therapy.org, and biologyispoetry.com.net and .org, and also an associate professor of microbiology at The Ohio State University. And I'm here once again reading this book by Mary Yule and uh, using it for inspiration uh, to talk about phages. So I'm not going word for word from Mary Yule. Uh, instead, actually, what I'm doing today is I am going to be talking about stuff that is discussed in the article Hobbes and Abaddon 2016. And also, I am going to attempt to script myself today. I tend to be very bad at being scripted. Uh, but I've got here on my cell phone, need to put in the password, uh, a script, <laughs> a 25 item list that I'm going to go through and with luck uh, ultimately turn it into some sort of web page. I should also point out that I'm sitting here in Dry Creek once again, uh, which mostly is dry, but you can actually see water behind me. And uh, this is uh, west of Sedona, Arizona. So here we go. So what I'm going to be talking about today are different types of phage infections. And everybody's heard of lytic versus lysogenic. And what I'm going to do is try to convince everybody that there's a, not only a whole lot more to phage infections than lytic versus lysogenic, uh, but also that uh, using the phrase lytic versus lysogenic is only something you should do when you are talking about the different types of infections that can be displayed by phages, which in fact are temperate and also which are lytic. And hopefully that will make more sense as I go on. So scripting myself. So most bacteria possess peptoglycan cell walls. Exceptional are those few which don't possess cell walls, such as mycoplasma. Uh, so David Prangishvili says that uh, archaeal viruses may be more diverse morphologically than bacteriophages are uh, because it's easier for these viruses to span going in or coming out again uh, the cell walls of archaea uh, versus the tougher peptidoglycan cell walls that you see with uh, bacteria. So we're going to be talking mostly about going from the inside out today rather than going from the outside in. So bacterial cells are literally difficult to move through. Sorry, bacterial cell walls are literally difficult to move through. They are a barrier to both entrance and exit. So the phage has to have adaptations that allow them to get their nucleic acid into bacterial cells through cell walls. And they also have to have means of getting the virions that they produce out of cells and through these cell walls. Only a few phage types are able to move their virions through these cell walls inside out without destroying the cell walls. And we're going to talk about those types of phages first. These are phages that release their virion progeny continuously, or perhaps more accurately, we should say chronically. So they produce their phages inside of the cell, and then the phages move through the cell wall without actually destroying the cell wall, uh, thus releasing the virions into the extracellular environment. So this process of moving through the cell wall without destroying it is known as virion extrusion, and during virion extrusion, uh, the chronically released virions are also mature. So before they have extruded through the cell wall, they're not yet mature virions. They're not yet, yet infectious uh, virions. But after they come out the other side, in fact, they are. So these virions that are extruded are, are the, uh, the uh, filamentous uh, phages, like phage M13. Infections that chronic release their virions are a kind of productive infection, and that's an important term here. There are two types of phage infections, not lytic versus lysogenic, but productive versus latent. It just so happens, as I'll get to, that most productive infections are in fact lytic, and of course latent infections in phages are called lysogenic. Uh, but it's productive infections, virion productive infections that are important here versus latent infections. Most productive phage infections, and therefore most phages, 
release their virions lytically, so they don't release it chronically. And what lytically means is that in order for the virions to move from inside the cell to outside the cell, they must destroy the cell wall. This is a process called lysis. So lysis destroys the bacterial cell wall along with the phage infection and the bacterium itself. So you end up with death and mayhem when you have lysis. But what it does do is it removes the peptidoglycan layer as well as the uh, plasma membrane, uh, which serves as barriers to movement of phages from inside of the cell to outside of the cell. Now in the case of these lytic phages, the phages in fact are mature, more or less, prior to their release. So the process of lysis is not a maturation process so much as just a release process, but it does have the effect of terminating the infection of the phage. So the phage infection has a start when the phage is transporting its nucleic acid across this peptidoglycan barrier into cells, and with lytic phages it has an end, which is the point of release of the virions, again involving movement across the peptidoglycan layer. So virions are released in order to start new infections, so they can go on and find new uh, bacteria to infect, so that, in fact, the phages can display exponential growth. Another type of infection, one that is neither chronic nor lytic, is lysogenic, and this, as noted, is a kind of latent infection. A phage that can infect lysogenically is described as temperate, so temperate phages display lysogenic cycles. They are not called lysogenic phages or lysogenic viruses. In fact, by and large, archaeal viruses are not lysogenic either because they tend not to be released lytically, but instead chronically. Lysogenic means that it's capable, something is capable of generating lysis. A lysogenic infection is a kind of latent infection where, it is, where the virus is not producing virion progeny. But when a temperate phage that is also a lytic phage produces virion progeny, a consequence, in fact, is lysis. In fact, it's not just lysis of the cell that's infected, but it could be lysis of the entire culture uh, that surrounds that cell, even if those uh, cells that surround the lysogen, uh, in fact, are not initially phage infected. That's the origin of the word lysogenic, lysis generating. You put these lysis generating bacterial cultures into another culture that otherwise wouldn't lyse, and lo and behold, that other culture lyses. Lysis generating. I have lost my place here. I, am, I have found my place here. So, Temperate phages is the word you use for a phage that can display either latent infections or productive infections. And strictly speaking, a lysogenic phage is a phage, I shouldn't say that, <laughs> a lysogenic infection is an infection that involves the latent infection of a bacterium with a phage that is capable of generating lysis. So tempered phages don't just have latent infections, they also have productive infections. Otherwise, they wouldn't be called viruses, because really the underlying basis of what is a virus is something that can display a virion productive infection, something that can produce virions. And these productive infections by tempered phages can be either chronic or lytic. Now, most of the productive infections by tempered phages, in fact, are lytic, and hence the term lysogenic is applicable, in most cases, to the bacteria that are latently infected with a tempered phage. Uh, but in fact, some tempered phages uh, instead uh, are, are, uh, display productive infections that are instead chronic. And, and the best example of that that we have, or at least the most famous one, uh, is the uh, phage that, in fact, encodes cholera toxin. It happens to be a chronically infecting phage, and it's also a temperate phage. A lysogenic cycle occurs during a lysogenic infection forming a bacterial lysogen. Again, 
It's bacteria that are lysogenic, it's not phages. We have tempered phages. Tempered phages can infect latently. We call the process of a latent infection by a tempered phage a lysogenic cycle, and the result is a lysogen, which is a kind of bacterium. Lysogenic cycles involve phage existence as a more or less naked genome known as a prophage. So the phage gets into the cell. If it decides to display a lysogenic cycle, then it stays in that cell as something we call a prophage, which is slightly modified over the genome as found in the virion. Prophages exist either integrated into the bacterium's chromosome, which is something that everybody learns and knows, right? Or instead as a plasmid prophage. This is somewhat less understood or appreciated that there are many phages out there, temperate phages, that in fact when they infect latently, they don't integrate into the host chromosome, they instead form plasmids. In fact, as a consequence of that, there's a great deal of overlap between what is a temperate phage and what is a plasmid. Plasmid prophages can either be circular, which is what we think of, you know, closed uh, strand circular uh, uh, double-stranded DNA, uh, which is what we think of usually when we think of a plasmid, or in fact they can be linear, in which case they have to have some way of protecting their ends, but nonetheless they are not closed circular. A phage that is not temperate, however, uh, is a phage that can be described as obligately productive or instead as strictly productive. And people use other words for this. However, what they don't tend to use is the word productive when they say this. They almost always say strictly lytic or uh, obligately lytic. And the reason for that is because most phages, in fact, are lytic rather than chronic. So as a consequence, we've become a little bit lazy and not thinking that there are other examples of strictly or obligately that is not temperate uh, besides phages that are strictly or obligately lytic. So therefore, if they are chronic infectors, then they are obligately or strictly chronic. Although I have to say that people just don't use that phrase. But nonetheless, it's legitimate. Since you have phages that are both temperate and chronic infectors when they display productive infections, and others that are not temperate but they're still chronic, and we just don't really have a good word for that that people use regularly, at least so far as I know. Admittedly, I'm much more of a lytic phage guy than a chronic phage guy, so I might be wrong here. But nonetheless, we do need a word for those phages that are not latent, that don't display latent infections, uh, but in fact are uh, chronically, chronic when they uh, produce their virions. And obligately or strictly chronic is a good word. On the other hand, if they are lytic, then we can say obligately or strictly lytic. And what we usually mean when we say that is that these phages are not temperate. And that's legitimate usage. It is unfortunate, however, that many people use the word just lytic when they are describing what should be described as obligately or strictly lytic phages. A lytic phage is not necessarily an obligately or strictly lytic phage. Most temperate phages, in fact, are lytic phages. When you say lytic phage, and I hear you say it, I immediately say to myself, oh, they must be talking about both obligately lytic phages and temperate phages that have lytic productive cycles. But in reality, mostly what people are saying when they say lytic is, is simply obligately lytic or strictly lytic. My preference would be that people wouldn't do that. And the reason I would prefer that people not do that is because it kind of wipes over the fact that you have these temperate phages out there, which in fact are also lytic. So virulent is another word for obligately or strictly lytic, and thus not temperate. So it's important to use these terms obligately and strictly if what we're trying to say is not tempered. Because most tempered phages are also lytic phages, and not only that, but most infections by tempered phages, at least so far as I understand, are in fact lytic infections rather than latent infections. It just so happens that the 
lysogenic infections are both longer and they're more noticeable than the lytic infections by temperate phages. So we tend to associate the idea of temperate with the idea of, uh, sorry, I'm hearing people in the background here. We tend to associate the idea of temperate, of lysogenic, with an inability or a lack of display of lytic cycles. But in reality, uh, temperate phages are just as able to display lytic cycles as obliquely lytic phages are. Hello there. I'm lecturing to the world here. I see that. What are you <laughs> talking about? I am talking about viruses that are able to infect bacteria and the types of infections that in fact they display. Because much of the world, despite the fact that they are well-educated in this, don't completely understand the uh, subtleties of it all. <laughs> are you a biologist? Or yeah, I'm a, uh, I'm a professor of biology at Ohio State University. Wonderful. <laughs> nice. Have a good one. So let's see, where was I? Ah, oh, yes. So we also use the word virulent to describe these phages. And this has a bit of a history that's in fact rather complicated, but really when we're saying virulent, it's coming from the idea of virulent mutant. And that leads right away to an issue, and that is that we use the word virulent in multiple different ways when we're considering phages. We talk about virulent in terms of virulent mutants, uh, but in fact the original source of the concept of virulence for phages is equivalent to uh, virulence as we understand virulence more generally, and that is the ability of phages to destroy a bacterial culture. Uh, just like we think of virulence in, for a virus that infects our cells and the uh, potential for that virus to make us sick. But in addition to that, phages, tempered phages particularly, can encode uh, bacterial virulence factors and therefore contribute to the virulence of uh, the bacterium itself. And although that's not something that usually gets confused with the idea of virulent or, or virulent mutant or a virulent phage, nonetheless it's a, another way of using the word virulent or virulence uh, in association with phages. So although it's legitimate to you say a virulent phage and to really mean obligately or strictly lytic uh, when you're saying that, keep in mind when you say that, that in fact there is a lot of baggage that comes along with the idea of virulence as associated with uh, phages. If phages are both strictly lytic and not descended from tempered phages, then we can describe these phages as professionally lytic. And ideally when people use the word lytic without qualification, uh, what they are trying to say is professionally lytic. Professionally lytic means that not only are they not going to display latent infections, but they also aren't closely related to temperate phages. And that means they're not going to be re recombining readily with uh, prophages in the cells that they infect. Uh, and it also means that they are less likely to be carrying bacterial virulence factors. Professionally lytic phages are preferred for phage therapy. Above all, virulent mutants are not professionally lytic phages. So when we say we would prefer to use lytic phages, when we're using phages as antibacterial agents, uh, what we really mean when we say that, ideally, is that we would prefer to use professionally lytic phages. Now I'm not totally against the idea of using tempered phages as antibacterial agents. Uh, but generally, people prefer to use professionally lytic phages. And ideally, they would state that explicitly in that manner. Uh, it, it's okay if you use an alternative way of saying professionally lytic, but why not just use professionally lytic? I've been trying to popularize that uh, phrase. I did not invent that phrase. Uh, and in fact, one of the important things that I talk about in Hobbes and um, Abaddon 2016, or I should say we talk about, uh, is in fact um, the usage of professionally lytic and how it would be nice if people simply use that term. Lastly, chronically released tempered phages would be the least useful 
for phage therapy purposes. Chronically infecting phages don't kill outright bacteria, and certainly if we don't want to use tempered phages, then we shouldn't want to use chronically tempered phages as well either. So this is Steve Abaddon of phage.org, phage-therapy.org, biologyispoetry.org.net.com, The Ohio State University, and Lord knows what else. And I am sitting here in the middle of Dry Creek, which really is dry except for that puddle that's sitting right there next to me. Although it wasn't dry a few months ago, there was like huge amounts of water. And it's absolutely beautiful down here. It's early in the morning. The sun is still coming up over the cliffs. And I hope you have a great day.